The pen Gwyn gave me when I graduated from my MBA was too expensive to use, but when the two cheap ballpoint pens and micro ballpoint pen we had in the office failed, I had no choice. I was surprised at how it felt in my hand. It was smooth but secure, perfectly balanced, and the ink flowed beautifully. All it took was one check on paper to the gardener, and by the time I signed my name, I vowed never to use another pen in my life. Gwyn smiled when I opened her gift and said the pen was beautiful, but she beamed with pride and delight when she saw me using it a year later, and I told her how much I loved it, how I wish I had her to sign my divorce papers. I met Gwyn right after college. We had mutual friends. We were all relaxing after four years of late nights between partying and studying, so we'd gather at the lake or someone's house or look for a bar or dance club to enjoy our last bit of freedom. Many of us had job offers, others were going to graduate school in the fall, and a couple of us who didn't have firm plans had to get serious about making plans once the summer was over. I went to school from the third grade with two twin friends, Jeff and Paul, whom we always called Mutt, and since their parents were Catholics, they had five other sisters. Their lake cottage was larger than most due to the size of their family, so we went there often. It was a Tuesday, about midsummer. When Matt and Jeff picked me up in their old station wagon, a great car for many reasons, but mainly because it carried a lot of people and gear for whatever we were doing. And after stopping for a case of beer and with three bags of ice to cool it down, we drove to the lake. Matt and Jeff were twins, but you'll never meet two guys who were so different and yet completely in sync. Matt was dark-haired and brown-eyed, a little reserved, but very funny when he spoke. Jeff was blonde with forest eyes, always chatting, and was everyone's friend. Matt handled the logistics, and Jeff was a people man. Jeff was on the phone for the entire two hours of the drive to the lake, spreading the word to our friends who were in town. Matt got us there before everyone else, so we prepared the pontoon boat with coolers for food and drinks. Our timing was good because as soon as we finished, people started to show up. Within 45 minutes, we had about 18 people running around getting snacks, beer, water, soda, soccer balls, towels, sunscreen, swimsuits, and who knows what else onto the boat, with Matt desperately trying to get us organized. After another 15 minutes of chaos, we were all on the boat, except Jim, who was in the house using the restroom when we cast off and had to jump off the dock and swim to catch us, and headed out for another great summer day on the water. When you grow up in a small town your whole life, you tend to know a lot of people. And even those you don't know, you at least recognize from years of playing on sports teams, marching bands, debate clubs, theater performances, birthday parties, or just walking around the mall. I knew everyone on the boat that day, at least by sight, except the two women who came with Jenny Smith. Besides Jenny, Matt, and Jeff, my core circle included Angie, Leaf, Tony, Brian, and Billy, all of whom I had known since school. Everyone else I knew from middle school or high school. Neither of us were athletes, but we were fairly active young men, so we all looked pretty attractive and in good shape. One of the new women was tall and thin, with straw blonde hair and light blue eyes that were so clear it was a little unsettling. The other was shorter and curvier, with thick black hair, a constant smile that said she knew something both secret and funny, and dark brown eyes that simply sparkled with mischief. I've never been a Casanova. I dated quite a bit in high school, and although I had three long-term relationships with women in college, there were quite a few Fridays that I spent with friends and roommates. But when I saw Gwyn, I was drawn to her, and surprisingly, I didn't feel the least bit nervous when I walked up to her, where she was sitting with Jenny and the tall, skinny girl. Hi, Jenny. When are you and I getting married? I've known Jenny since kindergarten, and when we were in junior high, we made a fictitious promise that we would marry each other if we didn't find another partner. We had never dated, and we felt so comfortable with each other because of it. Give me a couple more days. I'm still hoping David Henry hasn't lost my phone number. I laughed, but so did Gwyn, which surprised me. I turned to her and extended my hand. I'm Pete, and you're new to the group. Nice to meet you, Pete, and you must be a poet. I'm Gwyn, and this is Eliza. 
I laughed again, and so did she. A poet? Unfortunately, no. Majoring in finance. The monkey with the typewriter is more creatively gifted than me. How do you fit into all this? Jenny interrupted before Gwyn could respond. Gwyn is my cousin, and Eliza is her college roommate. They are going to Toronto. Eliza has a job there. What will you do, Eliza? I asked, mostly out of politeness. She will have many fans today, but thin and long-legged are not my type. The Ruben-style figure of Gwyn is much more attractive to me. Voice recognition and artificial intelligence. I studied linguistics and was hired by a startup trying to create more accurate voice interfaces for cars, home appliances, and just about anything else you interact with. Wow. I didn't think it was possible, but... Finance suddenly became even more boring, I said with a slight shrug. Looking at Gwyn again, I said, and I'm guessing you're a world-famous pianist or medical researcher solving this cancer problem. Order Gwyn hiccuped and replied, Really? This cancer problem? I might need a grant to study guys with limited vocabulary. It could save millions. It turns out that Gwyn was actually a business student looking for a position in marketing or sales. It didn't take me long to see that her natural enthusiasm and energy would serve her well in these types of jobs. She was exactly what you imagine a live weir to be. Super funny and very witty, she made me laugh many times that day. I'm not sure I said more than a dozen words to anyone other than Gwyn, while everyone on the pontoon seemed to be moving around, and Jeff and our friends Tiffany, who followed me around for most of my senior year, and Kevin, who ran cross-country and track with Matt and I, sat with us for quite a while. I didn't move any further. Three feet from Gwyn, all that afternoon and evening. When we parted at sunset, I had her number and she had mine, and we seemed equally excited about it. Gwyn's house was a 45-minute drive from mine, so we were close enough to see each other regularly, but not so close that we ran into each other by chance, which was probably not a bad thing for a budding relationship. There's less chance for misunderstandings or silly jealousies in those awkward first days and weeks. As a couple, we hit it off immediately, and after a couple of dates, I knew this woman was my everything. She was so lively and energetic, just a constant breeze of attention mixed with banter and joy. Gwyn was so spontaneous, adventurous, and always up for anything, which complemented my more deliberate approach to things. We shared similar tastes in music, singer-songwriters and bluegrass, and food, Thai and Vietnamese as well as American comfort food. We shared interests in hiking, lake swimming, horror movies, and TV sitcoms, and not only did we both love dogs, but we both preferred shepherds. And her large expressive eyes, sensual mouth, smooth neck, and feminine curves kept me physically aroused whenever she was around me. You could tell I was very keen, and she seemed just as keen on me. We dated at least half a dozen times as a couple and as many more times on group dates with our extended gang of friends and acquaintances before I brought up the exclusivity issue. I was a little nervous, of course. Although I was sure that she had a lot of feelings for me, there is nothing like making yourself vulnerable to realize that you can never be 100% sure of something. We went to a casual dinner, and then to an above-average slasher movie, and we were parked in her parents' driveway in front of a dark house. We had been kissing for half an hour or so, with my hands on her big round breasts. We slowly stopped our kissing as Gwyn came to her senses. God, you're amazing, she said, breathing heavily. I love the way you do this to me. And I love doing it. You smell so good. You drive me crazy. Flattery will open all doors for you, young man. She was so seductive when we made love, and her soft but persistent kiss kept me on my toes. I would really like to do this, I whispered. Would you like to get away for the weekend before I start work? I'd really like to spend time with you so I can fully explore you. Oh, I think that's a great idea. Where are you thinking of going? There was a resort on a private lake about three hours away. It wouldn't have been cheap, but back then I wanted our first time together to be very special, and I've always believed that you get what you pay for. I was thinking about Malone. It's the end of the season, so I'm sure we'll find a spot. Ooh, you know how to get my attention. I've always wanted to go there. Have you been there before? No, never. My parents went there for one of their anniversaries. 
They praised it a lot. They said it was the perfect place for special occasions. So you don't take all your girls there? Well, it's my turn. You're my only girlfriend, Gwyn. That's so sweet. You always know what to say to me. She smiled her radiant smile and kissed me tenderly. I waited, hoping for something else, but she seemed to have finished her thought. I've never been afraid to tackle something head-on, no matter how awkward it may seem. So when the silence dragged on, I intervened. Am I the only guy you're dating? Gwyn looked at me with loving eyes, and her smile somehow changed without losing its shine. I have no room in my heart for anyone else. You fill my thoughts even when you're not with me. I kissed her, first tenderly, then with more passion, and she answered me. She was always ready to meet me without reservations, and that always turned me on. We kissed for another twenty minutes. When I walked her to her front door, she walked on unsteady legs. We kissed one last time and she went inside. I had a long drive home, which allowed me to review the evening and our last conversation, and although I didn't hear her say exactly that we were exceptional, I knew from a business communication course that people hear and speak differently. Just because she didn't use the exact same words as me didn't mean she didn't mean the same thing as I did. I felt like she told me in her own way that she wasn't dating anyone else, and that warmed me up inside. My job at a regional accounting firm started after Labor Day, and it's been a busy few weeks for me. I wasn't as interested in accounting, but the interpersonal and analytical skills I learned were critical to my long-term goal of getting into management consulting. I was tired from studying so much during the day, so most of my contacts in those first two or three weeks with Gwyn were on the phone, not in person. Gwyn was in the final stages of interviewing for a job in the sales department of an office equipment company, so she was also busy, but every time we talked, she came alive, so bubbly and funny, and that also cheered me up, despite my fatigue. We saw each other both weekends in September, and every time we were together, I felt whole. I had booked a room at Malone for the last weekend of September, and the sexual tension our upcoming trip was creating between us was off the charts. We both knew we would be physically intimate then. And since we had less opportunity to relieve some of the tension, it only grew until our telephone conversations were filled with hints and ambiguous jokes. I swear I could feel her natural self in the car shortly after I picked her up for our special weekend. And even though we were only holding hands in the car, I wasn't calm, and she squirmed in her seat throughout the entire drive. We were pretty quiet. I had to concentrate on driving more than usual because my mind wanted to wander to pictures of us having fun in our luxurious room. Gwyn was such a sexy woman, and I was about to find out how reality matched my dirty dreams. I checked us in at the massive dark wooden counter in the lobby and picked up two key cards and then we carried our small bags up to our room on the top floor. We planned to get changed and then go to a restaurant for dinner. But I already mentioned that Gwyn is spontaneous and incredibly horny after almost four weeks of limited access to my body. We had just closed the door behind us when she hugged me, kissed me passionately, and almost carried me to the huge bed. We fell on top of her and she started tearing my clothes off. My polo and jeans flew off in different directions, soon followed by her tight sweeter and sweet pants. I don't know what happened to the socks and shoes, but we were naked on top of the covers and tried our best to absorb each other into ourselves. I've never felt so out of control. Oh God, oh God, oh God, she repeated over and over as we made love. I don't even know. I realized she knew what she was saying, but then I heard, I love you so much, Pete. I love you so much. I love you too, Gwyn. Very, very much. We remained connected as we returned to reality. I held myself on my elbows so as not to put pressure on her, but she wrapped her sculpted arms around my neck and pulled me towards her. I don't want to hurt you, I said quietly. Then let me feel all of you against all of me, she replied softly. You are my ideal man, Mr. Patterson and I meant everything I said. Do you think I'm God? She laughed, her breath tickling my ear and making me shiver. She squeezed me to emphasize the point. I love you. It makes me so happy, Gwyn. 
because I love you too. I kissed her, trying to convey with my lips what seemed so insufficient in words. She reciprocated my feelings. I rolled onto my side. We kissed, looking into each other's eyes, caressing each other's bodies tenderly. It was the most intimate moment of my life. It didn't take long before we started the second round. Our second association was less turbulent, but still passionate and energetic. We showered, still planning to go to dinner later than planned, but did I mention that Gwyn is spontaneous? Showering together led to more energetic sex in the huge shower. Dinner was hamburgers and fries from late night room service. We slept naked, tightly wrapped around each other. It seemed like we couldn't get enough of the physical contact. I woke up to a pair of incredibly beautiful brown eyes looking at me with love. I smiled widely. I couldn't help but smile. I opened my soul to Gwyn, and she accepted me completely. Good morning, love, she said. Good morning, I replied. What would you like to do today? She giggled. Well, not what you want. Then maybe we should eat breakfast and then I can see what else we can do. Don't you think you've done enough? She raised an eyebrow and smiled widely. I can never get enough of you. You always say the perfect things to me. She hugged me, kissed me tenderly, and then began to untie her legs and arms from mine. I need to go to the toilet, and then we need to get out of this room before we fall apart again. We did go for breakfast, and then took a slow walk along one of the hiking trails around the lake. It was really beautiful, especially with the leaves starting to change colors, but I couldn't really notice the scenery when my eyes couldn't tear themselves away from Gwyn. But every time I looked at her, I caught her looking at me, so it was a misfortune that we shared. The rest of the weekend was just as magical. We couldn't get enough of each other. We made love again on Saturday evening twice, and then slowly and tenderly, before leaving on Sunday mid-afternoon. Our ride home was quiet again, but it was a completely contented, contented quiet. Gwyn got a job in sales, and, unsurprisingly, it killed her. Within six months, she was regularly ranked among the company's top three salespeople. My work was also going well. I mostly reviewed company financial statements, but there was quite a bit of accounting work for some non-profits and very small firms that were friends of our major partners. I didn't really like this detailed work. I enjoyed visiting clients and learning about their businesses, and after a few months I felt confident enough to propose changes not only to their accounting, but also to their business models. I received excellent reviews of my work, as well as a pay raise and performance bonus, because I took on a few extra clients during a busy period and guided them through it. Gwyn and I continued to grow closer, spending as much time together as possible, and we didn't have enough sex. I wasn't a virin when we met, and neither was she, but I had never experienced the quality or quantity of sex that we enjoyed, and Gwyn initiated it as often as I did. It's safe to say that we were both insatiable. As a sign of the deepening of our relationship, we persuaded our families to plan Christmas meals so that we could attend each family's holiday. My parents adored Gwyn, and her parents seemed pleased with me. We talked vaguely about renting an apartment together after the new year, and neither family raised serious objections, so that's what we did. Living together took some adjusting, and that was the first stumbling block we had to overcome together. Simple decisions about everyday things like organizing the kitchen and linen closets, scheduling cleaning and vacuuming in the living room, and how best to clean the bathroom revealed differences we didn't expect. Frustration over these small inconsistencies arose frequently during the first couple of months. But we were committed to each other, and we worked through each little conflict, with mostly kindness. Our personalities continued to mesh well, and our love softened any hurt feelings, especially when we remembered to apologize for thoughtless comments or passive-aggressive despondency. All our friends were going through similar things, which helped a lot. Seeing them struggle without the emotions that filtered our immediate experience helped us see new perspectives, which made some of our fights easier to resolve. Angie lived with her wife, fiancé. Leif and Billy lived together, platonically, they said, but we weren't quite sure. Tony and Brian were roommates in a two-room cottage outside the city, and Matt and Jeff lived as bachelors in an apartment away from the family home. We still saw all of them often. Tom, 
Angie's boyfriend, was quite nice. But he came to our group too late, so it was difficult for him to find his place among us. Jenny and Matt were on and off, so we saw them the most. We could never tell how serious their relationship was, but like us, they seemed well suited to each other. I asked Matt about his feelings, and Gwyn asked Jenny, but neither of them were very talkative about their relationship. I'm not sure how passionate their feelings were, but they were affectionate and seemed very comfortable together. Tony, Brian, and Jeff were still living a free lifestyle, although Jeff seemed to be having more success. He was a decent-looking guy, but he could walk in anywhere and within five minutes start talking to a table of the most attractive women in the place. He had a gift for gab and almost always went off with someone. It didn't seem to matter what their marital status was, single, engaged, married, or divorced, everyone was eligible for Jeff. He said he always asked and never pushed, and I believed him. He had enough women being himself. Tony was a little more scrupulous, but he was looking for a relationship. Brian was handsome and had more successes than failures, but he never stayed with the same woman for more than one night, and he liked to talk about his conquests in too much detail for my comfort. Once Gwyn and I synchronized the practicalities of living together, our love blossomed. We made love several times a week, and often more than once in a session. I couldn't get enough of her body and her soul moved along with a very active rhythm. We continued to have sex with the same frequency, and we experimented with new positions, with lingerie, with accessories, and we didn't just limit ourselves to the bedroom. We loved our sex life. Our union was not only physical. We talked about everything from national politics, Democrats are bad, Republicans worse, to business, Bezos and Musk are geniuses but assholes, to music, Babyface Ray is too aggressive, John Legend is too smooth, Lord Heron is just right. We talked about colors to paint our apartment. She liked pastel oranges and yellows. I liked deep blues and greens. We both wanted children. I wanted three girls, and she wanted a boy and a girl. And of course, we agreed on dogs, especially Australian shepherds. We lived together for almost a year when I started applying to business schools. We have discussed marriage as a general concept for us, but have not yet learned more about my CF situation. Oh, we didn't want to commit. I really didn't want to be away from Gwyn, but she insisted that I go to the best school that would accept me. I'm not a fan of brands, especially when it comes to things like studying. After all, there is no secret course that Harvard or Duke teaches that my local Catholic university does not know. So it really comes down to connections with businesses that are connected to the school and classmates that become friends. And since I wanted to stay around the old hometown, I was fine with St. Thomas University and the state school branch. Even if I had gone to Stanford or Rice, there wouldn't have been many connections back to our small Midwestern town of 60,000 people. So when St. Thomas accepted me for a full MBA, I decided to go for it but I still felt like I needed Gwyn's approval. So I brought it up over dinner one night with a little distraction. Honey, I'm thinking maybe state is my best choice for business school. I received a frown. Really? State? They're not even the best program in the city, let alone the country. I know you can do better, much better. Yeah, I guess, but business school won't be cheap. They don't give out much in the way of scholarships and I think I might graduate with honors at state, which might help with job offers. She snorted, but lovingly. You'll graduate with honors from any school you choose. I can see how smart you are and how hard you work. Her smile faded and she looked into my eyes. Please don't let me be the reason you give in to less than your best. What can I say? Gwyn knew me. Really, really good. But you are more important to me than the degree. I don't want to be far from you. She melted and smiled, as always when I confessed my love for her, what I did every day. You're just the sweetest person. I love you so much, Pete, but I'm not going anywhere, and wherever you go, there are planes, trains, and buses to bring us back to each author. It's an expensive solution to a problem we don't need to have. What's the best program here in the area? I asked. Probably St. Thomas. I saw they climbed the national rankings last year, and they were already in the top ten in the Midwest. 
Maybe I should apply there. It's a reputable school, and we can wake up together every morning. Gwyn looked skeptical, but she didn't reject the idea. I was sure that the more she thought about it, the more she would like it. Or at least she'll accept it, which is what she did. So I went there. Gwyn had always had confidence, but knowing that I had sacrificed a little academic prestige for her seemed to strengthen our relationship. We have always had a mutual relationship, but if you press the answer, I would say that I probably gave a little more to it than she did. She wasn't inattentive or distracted when she was with me, but she was a little more willing to make plans with friends that didn't include me or drink after work with work friends. But after I entered the program at the St. Thomas MBA, she seemed to come home more often instead of hanging out with co-workers after work, put her phone aside more often when she was with me, and was a little more attentive when we were together. I was the happiest man in the world. Business school was going well, just as Gwyn had predicted. I decided to study full-time. I'm a firm believer in the efficiency of batch production versus parallel production. We get better and faster results when we concentrate on one thing rather than trying to do too much at once like working and studying. Of course, not everyone has a choice. But since I could afford to take 21 months off work to study, I did it. I was in the top cohort in my class with three others, and I received a lot of attention from professors and classmates, which translated well into job offers after graduation. Even though my undergraduate degree was in finance, I chose to specialize in finance for my MBA. I just liked the quantitative side of things, and consulting companies liked people who could build models and forecasts. I proposed to Gwyn at the beginning of my second year of business school. We were on one of our favorite hikes, and it was a perfect fall day. The leaves were halfway through changing color, so there was as much yellow and red as green. The sun was shining, but there were fluffy clouds, and the air was cool enough to keep us comfortable during the hike and warm enough that we could sit in the sun in our t-shirts without feeling cold. I thought it was a metaphor for our life together, past, present, and future. Perfect. Gwyn was sitting on a rock at our favorite vantage point. I knelt down, untying my shoelace and then tying it again. She drank from her water bottle and looked at the forest covering the hills. Gwyn, my love. She took another quick sip of water and looked at me. Hmm? Will you marry me? I took out the ring I bought a few weeks ago. She looked stunned for a moment, and then her eyes filled with tears, and her mouth broke into her brightest smile, and she threw herself at me, wrapping her arms around my neck. We fell to the ground, nose to nose, and she kissed me again and again, until she simply pressed her lips to mine and held them there with a firm caress. I love you so much, Pete, she said tears streaming from her eyes. I would really like to spend the rest of my life with you. I smiled, and my own tears came out. I am the luckiest man in the world. I love you more than I can express in words. We made love that beautiful day at our favorite vantage point. Gwyn is spontaneous, after all. And our emotions were at their best. Our wedding was planned for the following summer, at the end of June after my graduation in mid-May. My parents threw me a graduation party, but we held back a bit because we felt we would be asking friends and family to give us gifts again. My parents gave me a very nice leather set, a handbag, a briefcase, and a business card holder. And of course, Gwynnie found the perfect pen, although it took me several months to realize it. Her card was simple and ultimately prophetic. I hope this pen writes our future. Love always, Gwyn. The wedding was like every wedding, but it was ours, so it was both incredible and unforgettable. The flowers arrived late, but that was the only hiccup. In front of most of our friends and almost all of our families, we entered, solemnly repeated our vows of devotion, exchanged wedding rings, then posed for photographs. We dined on a choice of beef, chicken or vegetarian options, and danced, releasing the pent-up stress of planning and executing the wedding. Some of our friends got completely drunk. We did the obligatory garter and bouquet toss, cut the cake, and then we left for our hotel room, where I carried Gwyn over the threshold. We showered together, then made love, tenderly, and only once, before falling asleep.
The next morning, we had lunch with our immediate family and then headed off for our honeymoon, a week and a couple of days in Vancouver and Banff. It was a magnificent nine days, and even the usual travel annoyances could not mar our celebration of love. Gwyn was everything I ever wanted in a partner, and she showed me through both words and actions that she felt the same about me. We were, in short, completely happy with each other. We returned home as committed and loving newlyweds, ready to embrace our marriage, our jobs, and everything that came our way together. Gwyn went to work in sales for an IT company that sold hardware and contracted with software providers to offer customized solutions to local and regional companies. The learning curve was steep, but she got the hang of it with a few mistakes, not too expensive, and her boss was already hinting at moving her to a sales manager position within a couple of years. I joined a boutique consulting firm specializing in consumer product expansions with good valuation prospects for mergers and acquisitions, which became my area of expertise. I saw it as a place to learn, with the prospect of making myself an integral part of the growing part of the firm if everything worked out as it should. We were, in short, quite happy at work. Since we lived together for three years before our marriage, we did not make the nest that many young spouses do. We had an active social life with our friends, parties at home, dinners at restaurants, trivia nights at bars, late-night concerts in the big city, softball games and recreational league football. We did what everyone else did. But our friend group began to fall apart along predictable lines, singles and couples. Jenny and Matt still had an unclear relationship for the rest of us, so they teetered on the edge with Gwyn and I, Angie and her husband Tom, who got married a few months before us, and Tony and his fiance Deb on one side, and Jeff and Brian and Brian's new roommate Noah on the other. The singles were all about the action, and although the rest of us were ready for a pub crawly, we would reach our limit an hour or two before the singles were ready to call it a night, which usually resulted in some friendly banter between us. Leaving already? Oh, I guess it's after five. No more promotions for seniors tonight. Happy hunting, guys. We've already caught our companions for the night, so let's take them home. Hurrying home to take your evening medications? Good luck at STD Roulette tonight. Already reached your one beer limit? Remember to polish your beer glasses before you leave the house tonight? Not every time we went out to bars, but often I saw that Gwyn wanted to stay longer than the rest of us couples. She loved getting out of the house, loved new situations, and her energy level was always elevated when we were around people. I was usually attentive to her pleasure when we made love, but on those nights, when she was a little quieter than usual on the ride home, I showered her with extra attention, and she appreciated my efforts. Soon the banter spread to our other events. It was always fun, but there was a subtext to it. We moved in different circles, one with more commitments, one with fewer, but neither of us had enough confidence to not wonder if we were in the circle we wanted to be in. Are you tired of his snoring already? How do you avoid yawning while listening to the same first date conversation every week? Is he still using the same old positions? Let me know when you want something new. Which Nobel Prize winner is yours this week? Did the old man take a nap this afternoon? Hey, Trojan called. They wanted to remind you that the rubber in your pocket expired three years ago. It was a couple of years after our wedding before we started talking seriously about having children. Gwyn's company was seriously considering promoting her to the position of sales manager. She wouldn't have the same income opportunities, but she would have more regular work hours, and the management career path offered much more opportunity for growth than her sales job. It would be better for pregnancy. My M&A valuation practice at my company was growing quite well, and I was a key part of it, so my future looked promising as well. I had to travel a couple of times a month for two to three days, which was a little destabilizing, but nothing stood in the way of conceiving a child and caring for my pregnant wife. Gwyn was a little more hesitant than I expected. It's clear. She will do all the hard work. However, she seemed more reserved than I expected. We both often talked about how much we wanted children. We even joked about names for boys and girls. We were both a couple of years shy of 30, so it seemed like it was time to organize around this next step. But she resisted. She didn't refuse. 
but she did shy away every time I brought it up. I tried a straight approach to Thanksgiving. Darling, what do you think about children? I want to have your children, Pete. Let me think about it some more. Of course, my love. Would you like to discuss this with me? No. I just want to make sure I'm really ready. There's no going back. I let the holidays pass and then tried a more indirect route in early January. What do you think of Kate as a girl's name, dear? It's cute. Reminds me of Kate Rothstein. Did you know her well? Not really. Just came to mind when you said that name. I waited for her to share more, but it didn't come. I decided to intervene. Have you thought about our family yet? Not really. There's so much going on at work right now. And with Mom's 55th birthday coming up, Dad wants me to help him plan the party. I tried again a month or so later. Remember Will from work? We went to his wedding last summer. Of course. What's wrong with him? He told me today that he and Heather are expecting a baby. She's been pregnant for a couple of months now. He says she can't get enough of peanut butter and cantaloupe. This is great news for them. I hope her pregnancy goes smoothly. Let me know when you need a supply of peanut butter. Fine. And that was all. She didn't lose her temper and told me not to bring it up again. She simply did not engage with me on this topic. And I wasn't offended by her because of it. It just seemed strange to me, given our past conversations. The rest of our interactions proceeded as usual. We enjoyed our time together, made love as often as always, went to work and did all the things we liked to do. We just didn't talk about children. Samir came, as always, on time. We started going to the Laika with Gwyn's family or mine. When we had a free weekend, planted a vacation to the Upper Peninsula for August, and just kept doing what we were doing. Life was good, but I started to feel a little uneasy. The issue with the child began to bother me. I'm a planner, and although I'm a patient guy, it's not an infinite virtue. It was also the first time I felt even a small rift with Gwyn, and the rift seemed to get a little wider every time there was some kind of reference to children, even if it wasn't about us. Our parents hinted at more grandchildren, and our friends' jokes in that direction from time to time, and Gwyn simply stayed out of the fray. On Independence Day, Mutt and Jeff suggested a long weekend at their family lake house where Gwyn and I met, and it seemed like the whole gang was there. We said we were in. Jenny, of course, was going to be there too. Angie and Tom said yes, and Brian and Noah also brought girls with them. Only Tony and Deb, now married, were busy with her family in Ohio for the holiday. We agreed on our contribution and looked forward to a few days of relaxation with good friends. We decided to go on Wednesday and return on Monday evening. Summer came, as always, on time. We started going to the lake with Gwyn's family or mine when we had a free weekend, planned a vacation to the Upper Peninsula for August, and just kept doing what we were doing. Life was good, but I started to feel a little uneasy. The issue with the child began to bother me. I'm a planner, and although I'm a patient guy, it's not an infinite virtue. It was also the first time I felt even a small rift with Gwyn, and the rift seemed to get a little wider every time there was some kind of reference to children, even if it wasn't about us. Our parents hinted at more grandchildren, and our friends' jokes in that direction from time to time, and Gwyn simply stayed out of the fray. On Independence Day, Mud and Jeff suggested a long weekend at their family lake house, where Gwyn and I met, and it seemed like the whole gang was there. We said we were in. Jenny, of course, was going to be there, too. Angie and Tom said yes, and Brian and Noah also brought girls with them. Only Tony and Deb, now married, were busy with her family in Ohio for the holiday. We agreed on our contribution and looked forward to a few days of relaxation with good friends. We decided to go on Wednesday and return on Monday evening. The first problem arose when my firm signed on a major new client. A company in the Twin Cities was considering purchasing a cabinet shop in rural Vermont and wanted a quick estimate. They were planning an aggressive acquisition strategy and were willing to pay more for speed, so we hit the ground running. The 4th of July fell on a Sunday, so Monday was a holiday, but the client still wanted me on site Monday morning, 
which meant I needed to arrive in Vermont on Sunday evening. Of course, this town, nestled near Quebec City, had no airport, so I had to fly to Portland, Maine, and drive. I couldn't get there early enough on Sunday to make the trip, so I had to fly on Saturday, which meant leaving the lake early. I told Gwyn, who was disappointed but understanding. We saw married friends for dinner the next night, and Gwyn informed everyone that we would have to leave early due to my work commitments. This is bad, Angie said. Why do you have to leave, though? Someone should keep an eye on Pete, Gwyn replied, laughing. We're Midwesterners. We never want to be a burden. Besides, we're not going to take both cars to the lake. This is stupid, Gwyn. Pete can take your car and you can come back with Tom and me. Gwyn looked at me, happy to leave the decision to me. I was grateful for Angie's offer. I felt a little guilty that Gwyn had to miss so much of the weekend because of my work. If it's not a problem, and if Gwyn agrees, I think it's a great idea. Thank you, Gwyn smiled. I think she thanked both Angie and me. We arrived on Wednesday without any problems, and were accommodated in our small room with a double bed. Matt and Jenny met us, and Jeff arrived shortly after us. Brian and Noah arrived together, and they brought Alice and Roberta with them. We had not seen them before, but were glad to welcome them. Angie and Tom planned to arrive after dinner, and they arrived while we were cleaning up. It was a rowdy night, with a lot of beer consumed and lots of friendly banter, as befits a reunion of longtime friends. We interviewed Roberta, who was good-natured, and Alice, who was a little sensitive. At one point, she left, and Brian had to go after her to calm her down. This slowed our party down a bit, but it was still a fun evening. We were tired from the trip and the beer, and it was an unfamiliar bed, and our evening rituals were disrupted by four other people using the same bathroom, so by the time I got into bed, Gwyn was fast asleep. As usual, I was up before Gwyn the next morning, and when I went down for coffee, I saw Matt and Jenny packing their car. What happened, guys? Matt shook his head. Jenny was called into work. Too many nurses were out for the weekend. This is terrible. Don't they plan these things? Jenny laughed. They say yes, but every holiday is the same. I knew I was on duty, but I hoped that this time I would escape the bullet. Sorry, Jen. Will you be back, Matt? He shook his head. Jenny will be working overtime and will need some TLC. Plus, who wants to spend the holiday alone? You're a good guy, Matt. But I deny it, if you repeat. We laughed and then said goodbye. Even though we were outnumbered, we had a great day on the lake. Without Matt's guidance, it took us twice as long to load the pontoon boat. But once we set off, it was the same as always. We knew each other so well that the conversation flowed naturally. And with Alice and Roberta, we had enough novelty to keep things interesting. Even though Gwyn loved new people, she spent a lot of time getting to know two new women. We landed just before sunset and fired up the grill again. We were all pretty drunk and we continued drinking while Jeff and I cooked burgers and sausages. Cleanup was easy since we used paper plates, allowing us to quickly get back to drinking beer by the fire. With Roberta and Alice, feeling more comfortable, the conversation became a little vulgar and sharper. Angie and Tom, as well as Gwyn and I, were left to defend the honor of the married people, and I think we did a good job despite being outnumbered by singles. We did get some good hits, though. When I saw Gwyn yawning, I took her hand and led her upstairs to wash up before going to bed. I was hoping for some love, but once again we were separated by our prep routines, and she was fast asleep when I climbed in next to her. Friday was another gorgeous day, and although we were moving slower, we were in no rush, so we just took the day as it unfolded. After a couple of cups of coffee and some pastries and fruit, we loaded up the pontoon again and hit the road. Everyone got along great, and we mixed well. We jumped off the boat and swam, ate sandwiches and chips, and again drank a disproportionate amount of beer. I thought we'd have to do some beer shopping when we got back to shore, but without Matt to guide us, we made our way back slowly, and it was dark by the time we pulled into the dock. Unloading was going well until Tom and I tried to remove the large cooler from the boat. If we had been sober, we would have drained the meltwater first before unloading but we weren't. And we didn't do that. I walked first, backing up, 
and as Tom stepped onto the dock, the water in the refrigerator began to move and upset his balance, and his leg got stuck between the boat and the dock. He screamed in pain as the rough wooden dock scraped his shin, and to add insult to injury, the pontoon struck him in the calf, causing his knee to crash into the dock. I threw the refrigerator and grabbed it so it wouldn't fall into the water. I made it, but with his leg pinned between the boat and the dock and the fog in our heads, he still took a couple of hits before we freed him. The others ran up to see what had happened. With Tom limping and leaning on Jeff and I, we walked him home. His shin was skinned from knee to ankle, and there was a lot of blood, but it did not flow in a stream. He continued to moan, but after a few minutes, he seemed to pull himself together. None of us were able to drive, and he was embarrassed, so he told everyone he would wrap a towel around his leg and get into bed to see what it looked like in the morning. Angie was understandably upset, but agreed that he wasn't going to bleed to death, and it would be best to reassess the situation in the light of day. Angie helped him to their bed and stayed with him for a while to make sure nothing unexpected happened to him. The rest of us finished unloading the boat, very carefully so it took a long time, and then decided to order pizza for delivery. I noticed there wasn't much beer left, so Jeff got out a blender and started making margaritas. Since I had to get up and head back to town and then to the airport the next morning, I skipped the drinks. I still had beer that I was digesting. My abstinence from margaritas went to unnoticed in the first round. Angie came out to get a slice of pizza for Tom and another for herself, and said that Tom felt better now that he was lying down and his leg was taped. Everyone breathed a sigh of relief, and with some food in their stomachs and their worries about Tom temporarily forgotten, the conversation began again. Who else needs a margarita? Jeff asked. Pete? No, I'm fine. Come on, Grandpa, have a drink with us, shouted Brian, and his proposal was echoed by several others. I have an early day tomorrow. I'll catch up with you next time. Damn, Gwynny, you need a new man. One who knows how to have fun, Jeff said. Do you need another one? Gwynny, this was new to me. I've never heard anyone call her that. She once told me out of the blue when I was looking for pet names for her that she hated it. I was waiting for a fix. I could use another one. She emptied her glass and waved it as Jeff hurried to take it from her. Gee, Jeff made new drinks for everyone except me. We finished the pizza, and the chatting began again. Now it was just Gwyn and I on one side, and a bunch of drunk singles on the other. And for the first time in our entire relationship, Gwyn did not help me. Others sensed blood in the water and attacked without mercy. Gwyn did not join the attack, but she also did not help in defense. I'm not stupid, and fighting an unequal battle was never a smart choice so I quickly stopped talking. But since everyone else was good at giving in, they continued to press. Can't say anything true, Pete? Are you sure you don't want another one, Pete? We can make it non-alcoholic. Then you can almost feel like one of the real men here. Did you get swallowed by a cat, Pete? Get used to it, Gwynny. He'll have a dozen cats before you get home on Monday. He's turning into an old lady with cats before our eyes. Gwyn laughed at this. Nothing embarrassed me more than that little laugh. I sat still, but they were well beyond registering any social signals. I stopped paying attention and went in to myself. I really didn't like where this was going, and I started paying attention to Gwyn. Usually she looked at me when we were together, but that night her attention was elusive. She was looking at me out of habit, but she was just as likely looking at Alice or Jeff or Brian or Roberta or even Noah. I also noticed that Jeff began to pay more attention to Gwyn, showing himself in front of her. I doubt he realized it, but his instincts picked up that Gwyn wasn't as attracted to me as usual, and he began to play for her attention. It all made me very uneasy, and I really didn't like the idea of leaving Gwyn here without me. I stood up, yawning and stretching, and positioned myself directly in front of Gwyn, holding out my hand. She was drunk and looked at me with a question. I have to get up early, so it's time for bed. Pete needs his beauty sleep, shouted Noah. Come on, old man, Brian added. Just because you can't keep up the pace doesn't mean you have to drag Gwyn down. Yes, Gwynny. Tell the old man you'll catch up with him later. I'm going away for a few days, Gwyn. I want to spend some time alone with you. She frowned at our friends, but took my hand and stood up. 
We said goodbye and went upstairs. I soon realized that she was very drunk, but I got her to promise that we would have breakfast at a local cafe before I left in the morning. Again, she fell asleep when I returned from the bathroom. I woke us up at 7.30, and Gwyn was feeling very ill. I was also not in a good mood. Mutt had no one with him to clean up anything, so pizza boxes and glasses and empty tequila bottles were strewn around the living room and around the picnic tables. It looked like the aftermath of a dorm party. Our breakfast was very quiet, eerily quiet. I had a very bad feeling about the rest of the weekend. I'd like you to come home with me this morning, Gwyn. Really? Why? How can I tell her that my trust in her has been broken without making me defensive or resentful? I think it's going to be hard for Angie and Tom to give you a ride back to town without you. And judging by how those guys drank last night, they won't have any brains left after another night. I laughed to soften my judgmental tone. They're just relaxing, and I'm sure Tom will be fine after a good night's sleep. Even if he's not, I can ride home with someone else. Brian's car is already full. Jeff has a place. He came alone. Okay, Gwynny. You know better than to call me that. What the hell? It's true, I know. But why is Jeff allowed? She fell silent for a moment. It's always been like this, and there's no point in arguing with him. You know him. He won't stop. Have I ever given you a reason to be jealous? I've never heard him call her that. It's really not a question. I'm not jealous. Yes. I'm jealous of her. Then why don't you want me to stay? It's time to make a decision. Is it true or part of it? You didn't support me when they started attacking me last night. For the first time ever, I didn't feel like we were on the same team. I feel like there's a distance between us. I don't like it. She smiled sadly. I love you, you idiot. That hasn't changed and won't change. You don't need me to save you. You're doing just fine on your own. I don't want to cope alone. I will always be with you. Then come home with me. If you really want, you can come back after I leave for the airport. Don't be funny. It's a lot of driving and I'll be stuck at home alone. I don't want to be alone either. I was out of ideas and my bad feeling hadn't gone away, but there was nothing more to say. We paid the bill and returned quietly to the lake house. I went upstairs to gather my things while Gwyn began cleaning downstairs. There was no one in sight, and I bet there would be no one for several hours. I put my things in my bag and then struggled with myself. I have to trust her. I used to love her. We chose each other to be partners for life, but I had this bad feeling that I couldn't shake. Finally, I made the bed, cleaned the room, and closed the door. He took a deep breath and went downstairs. Gwyn met me and walked me to the car. Last chance. Are you sure you don't want to come with me? I asked. I'll see you when you get back. Have a nice trip. Love you. She kissed me tenderly. I left with a heavy feeling in my stomach. I stopped at Starbucks halfway home. While I was waiting for my order, I sent Gwyn a quick text. Stopped at Starbucks. Miss you. A minute later, I received her answer. I miss you too. I love you. I drove home, took a shower, and packed my things for the trip. I arrived at the airport a little after one and decided to call Gwyn. Loud music could be heard in the background. Hey, Pete, miss you. Me too. I'm at the airport. How's Tom doing? Not good. Angie took him to the hospital a little earlier. She called Jenny, and Jenny said there was a high risk of infection due to bacteria in the lake water. That completely freaked Angie out so they left. So now, there are six of you? We call ourselves the Core Six. I heard shouts and chants of Nuclear Six, Nuclear Six on the background. Then the voice I thought was Jeff's said, It's the Sexy Six. Gwyn laughed. I see you picked up where you left off last night. Don't be like that, Pete. We're just having fun. What's really bothering you? I sighed. I lost the pen you gave me for graduation. Oh, Pete, don't worry. I'm sure she'll be found. When was the last time you saw her? I'm sure I had it when I was at Starbucks earlier. I took a couple notes to remember the trip. But I didn't have it when I got home. Please look for it. Okay. Have you checked the car? I'm sure you just forgot it somewhere. I hope you're right. 
There was more noise and music in the background. It sounded like a drink meter. I need to go before I get too behind and they make me catch up all at once. Have a nice trip. I love you. I love you too, Gwyn. My flights were uneventful. I landed in Portland around 8 p.m. local time. Sent Gwyn a message, landed in Maine, but received no response. Got a rental car and stopped for a bite to eat at a local pub. Found my hotel, the Hampton Inn, and checked in. Sent Gwyn the details, but no response. I felt like I was on autopilot. He undressed and went to bed. Surprisingly, I fell asleep immediately. My emotions were on edge, and I was completely exhausted. No wonder I woke up at two in the morning and couldn't go back to sleep. I checked my phone. No messages. At five in the morning, I sent Gwyn a message. What the hell, Gwyn? Finally, I dozed off for an hour around six in the morning, but then I couldn't stand it any longer. I got up, took a shower, and went to breakfast at the hotel. Left for Vermont about 9.30. Alone with my thoughts, I thought through the scenarios, which calmed me down. By the time I arrived in Newport, Vermont, I had plans for several possible scenarios. I found my motel, but the room wouldn't be ready until three o'clock, so I went for a walk around the city. Found a nice little diner where I ordered a patty sandwich and a great chocolate milkshake. My phone rang as I was finishing the last drops of my cocktail. Hey, love, how was your trip? Wow, that was inconsistent. She saw my last message. I took the phone and called her. The call immediately went to voicemail, so she rejected the call. I was very offended and very angry. I sent a message. What the hell, Gwyn? There was no answer. I paid the bill, grinding my teeth. He went outside and found a park bench where he sat down, or rather swayed. I was furious and energy was flowing through my body. I needed to move to free her. I don't know how long I sat there, rocking back and forth, but eventually I calmed down. There was still no word from Gwyn. After I checked into the motel, I went for a walk again. I needed to get ready for meetings tomorrow. I checked my phone obsessively, so I turned it off. I decided to leave it off until I was at the airport again on Tuesday afternoon. I could put the rest of my life on hold for 48 hours. Turning off my phone was surprisingly effective for my concentration. I slept fairly well Sunday night. The fireworks display at the baseball field lasted about 20 minutes, and there weren't many explosions, and I arrived at my meetings with six furniture makers on Monday morning a few minutes early. I had almost everything I needed by mid-afternoon, but I wouldn't be able to make it to Portland to catch today's flight. So I started working on the model and forecasts at the motel. I made great progress, and by the time I left on Tuesday morning, I was almost done with it. I emailed my manager with a status report and then hit the road. The trip was uneventful and I dropped off my rental car with plenty of time to get to my gate. Once I boarded the plane, I took a deep breath and turned on my phone. It took a couple of minutes for it to sink, but when it did, I had tons of messages from Gwyn, but no calls. The reports began. Monday morning. Interesting. I think I knew what it meant. The messages began with apologies. Sorry for my absence. My phone was dead. I couldn't find the charger. We were having so much fun that we lost track of time. Then came the remorse. Miss you. Hope you have a good trip. What are you doing? Then she started to worry. Are you okay? Where are you? Why don't you answer? Then an outburst of anger. This is so stupid. Then again, an apology. Sorry. I'm so worried. And finally, a flash of despair. I love you please let me know you're okay. He typed a response. Everything is fine here. I forgot my charger too. Finally, I borrowed one. Gwyn's answer came immediately. So glad to hear from you. I love you. Got into trouble at work. I'll be back tomorrow evening, same time. She responded with a sad, smiley face. Miss you. Sorry. Need to get back to work. Then I remembered. Have you seen the pen? Another sad emoticon. No, I'll look. Love you. I nodded and turned off the phone again. He took a deep breath. The course was set. My flight was delayed by half an hour, but that didn't matter to me. I checked into a residence in a few miles from my office. 
I wasn't hungry, so I just went to bed. Again, I fell asleep immediately. My emotions were on edge, and I was completely exhausted. No wonder I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning and couldn't go back to sleep. I checked my phone. No messages. At 6 in the morning, I got up and went to the gym. 40 minutes on the elliptical felt like 35 minutes too much, but I managed it and felt better. I took a shower, got dressed, called work, said that I was taking a personal day, and went to my apartment. Gwyn usually left by 8.30, so I arrived around 8.45. Her car wasn't there, so I parked in my spot and went inside. First, I gathered my clothes and toiletries, packing them into two suitcases and a travel bag. I grabbed a couple of pictures my mom drew for one of her classes, my laptop, wireless keyboard and mouse, my coin jar from my desk, my yoga mat, and my exercise roller. My bike was in storage, but I didn't have room for it yet, so it had to wait with the furniture. I loaded up the car and then drove back to the hotel. Was back before noon. I turned on my laptop and started researching the divorcee. Our assets were mixed, but since we earned it about the same and contributed equally, the division should have been fairly simple. I was hoping Gwyn would agree to mediation. It would have saved us some money and maybe some bitterness. I had to focus all my attention on the tasks, so I had no energy left for my feelings. My pain and my anger were enormous, and I had to keep them under strict control. Otherwise, they would destroy everything around me. And maybe me, too. Gwyn usually came home between 5.30 and 6 wow, and since I wasn't due home until about 8, I didn't expect her until then. I thought about meeting her, but it's painful and angry. I knew I wouldn't be able to control them if I experienced Gwyn's full experience live. I'm not sure how I waited until 6. I must have just been starstruck, sitting at my desk, looking at my laptop. But when I came to my senses and saw that the time had come, I felt concentration descend on me. My preparation helped me find focus for the most difficult conversation I ever hoped to have. I called her number. Pete? She was clearly surprised to hear me. Did you arrive earlier? No, I arrived yesterday. Yesterday, but you said... I lied, just like you. What? What do you mean I lied? I didn't lie. She sounded empty. She knew I knew something. Please stop lying, Gwyn. I know, I know everything. What do you know, Pete? You're scaring me. What's going on? She was unconvinced. She knew I knew something. Please show me some respect, Gwyn. I know. She began to cry quietly. You know what, honey? I don't know what you're talking about. You didn't sleep alone Saturday and Sunday night. I know about everything. She cried a little harder. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry, Pete. I don't know what happened. We were drinking, and then we played spin the bottle, and then truth or dare. I don't care, Gwyn. I lied again. I didn't care. I hoped that somehow I was wrong, but she confirmed her change, and it killed me. How? How did you know? How do you think I knew? Did Brian say something? It would have been like him. Jeff said he wouldn't. Another stab into my heart. I lost my wife and a good friend, and probably his brother too. The pain was exquisite. I was almost carried away, lifted and carried away in the throes of betrayal. But I concentrated on the conversation, in the words that I needed to say. It doesn't matter. I hope we can work it out through mediation. We don't need to complicate things. What? What do you mean? Mediation? What are you saying? I can't be married to someone I can't trust with my heart, Gwyn. No! She sobbed. No, you can't want this. I love you so much. I need you, Pete. Your actions say otherwise. No, please, please come home. Please, we can talk about this. We can go to counseling. I know you want kids. We can start our family. Please, Pete, please just come home. I was home today to pick up some of my things. We'll need to divide up our assets, but that should be pretty simple. We'll also need to sort out furniture and TVs and such. I don't have strong feelings about that, so you can choose first. Gwyn was sobbing a lot. Please. No. Please, Pete. Please. Please, please, please. If it had only been Saturday night, I would have tried to save our marriage. 
But Sunday night? No, it was deliberate. And I can't accept it, Gwyn. I won't accept it. Pete, please, please don't leave me. I love you. I love only you. Please, please, please. I'll hang up now, Gwyn. I'll get back to you. No. The divorce was not entirely amicable, but not entirely contentious either. It was mostly just sad, with a few angry outbursts. Gwyn was consumed by her remorse, as was my decision. She tried to meet with me to explain what happened, but I refused. I didn't trust myself to be in her presence. I would either forgive her or hurt her, or both options. And I thought I already knew what happened. She is so spontaneous, and the connection between physical sex and emotional sex was much weaker for her than for me. Add to that a lot of alcohol, a few days without sex before, some anxiety about a huge life change like parenthood and a skilled suitor like Jeff, and a weekend of flirting that meant next to nothing to her completely destroyed me. But I didn't want to hear it from her, and I abruptly interrupted her a couple of times when she started to explain. Gwyn pushed for counseling, and our mediator felt it was worth exploring. I was strongly opposed to this, but when my refusal threatened to poison the atmosphere, I agreed. We had six sessions, four together, and one individual session each. I found out that she and Jeff were dating when we started dating. The day we met, her cousin Jenny brought her at Jeff's request. She wasn't serious about him, but they dated casually for a couple of months while we were dating. Gwyn denied that she had had other lovers since we met, and she was desperate to tell me what happened that Independence Day weekend. I think she wanted to ease her conscience, but I flatly refused. She could have confessed in her individual session. As I expected, we made no progress in the consultations. Gwyn was consumed by her guilt and needed some form of forgiveness. My trust in her was completely and irrevocably destroyed, and I saw no way forward with her as a partner. After completing the consultations, I received many calls where she was just sobbing, asking me to come back. I hated hearing how lost she sounded. In the end, she had no choice. And when we resolved all the issues, she accepted the divorce with as much grace as she could muster. Our parents were devastated. I didn't tell mom and dad any details directing them to Gwyn. I don't know what she told her parents, but she took the blame for mine. She didn't say what happened, but I think they might have read between the lines. Our friends were less surprised. Brian and Noah were not known for their discretion, and stories of the wild weekend quickly spread. Jeff was embarrassed at first, but when something became inevitable, the best talkers came forward, so he started bragging about it. It didn't win him any new fans, but most of his friends knew about his flaws, so they just chalked it up to Jeff being Jeff. Couples blamed themselves for not being there for Gwyn and I. There was a lot of blame, and no one wanted to choose sides. I was the offended party and a longtime friend, but I was also a loser who was cheated by another friend, so all my interactions with ex-friends were painful, awkward, and sad. I started avoiding them. I think Gwyn does, too. There was too much agony. One friend did make an effort. I left the office one evening around 10 and Matt was there. I didn't know how long he waited, but it was so Matt-like, just being there. Hi, Pete. Matt, how are you doing? Pretty lousy. Yes. He looked into my eyes. No pity, no challenge, just caring. I'm sorry. Jeff can be an asshole sometimes. Yes. We looked at each other for a few moments. It wasn't strange. It wasn't sentimental or corny. These were two friends who had shared everything for many years and knew each other well. I nodded and spoke first. Take care, Matt. I wish you a happy life. He was a little discouraged, but nodded and said decisively, Thanks, Pete, and you too. We parted without shaking hands. Having nothing else to do with my free time, I plunged into work. This shelter rewarded me with money and experience. But after a couple of months of suffering from many signs of depression, I decided to see a therapist. It didn't take long to realize that my longtime home was now an emotional minefield full of constant reminders of my failing marriage. I began looking further afield for work, and when another boutique firm in White Plains, New York, offered me an associate partner position, I accepted. I moved over the holidays and started working on January 2nd. 
I was surprised to receive a call from Gwyn on what would have been our wedding anniversary. I haven't heard from her since I moved, in fact a month or so before the move, so I was curious. Gwyn. Hey Pete, how are you? Good enough, I guess. How about you? It could have been better. She sounded devastated. What's happened? I have your pen. Ah, the pen. The instrument of our divorce. You can keep it. No need to remind. Jeff's sister found her. Did you put her in bed? Put it down. Why? I was afraid. Afraid? Afraid of what ended up happening. I could see it, even though I hoped I was wrong. You have no idea how much I wanted you to text me saying you found my pen. Gwyn sobbed, but only once. You asked me to go home with you. I asked. I never planned for this. I never thought something like this could happen. We were all friends. It was as safe as it could be. Yes, well, lessons learned. I miss you so much, Pete. Goodbye, Gwyn. I miss you too, I thought. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.